اطلب العلم اخي فهو درب به نور به ترقى به تحيا عالما حرا فخور اطلب العلم اخي فهو درب به نور به ترقى به تحيا عالما حرا فخور اطلب العلم اخي فهو درب به نور به ترقى به تحيا عالما When one sees the way the Prophet used to treat the slaves and the captives, again, you will become speechless. The Prophet did not leave anyone outside of his compassion and mercy. Here is Bilal, radiallahu anhu, and I am so proud to be named after Bilal. An Ethiopian slave who used to exist at the time of the Prophet. Insignificant man, meaning towards the tribes. And he was a slave with Umayyah. Umayyah la'natullahi alayh Bilal radiallahu anhu when he embraced Islam in secret Umayyah found out his Lord, the one who bought him, the one who had him and owned him he said I own your soul, I own your wealth, I own everything that you say you are not allowed to become a Muslim he said there is only one God so Umayyah brought him in the scorching sand and placed him in the middle of the desert and placed a stone over his chest the sand over there in Saudi Arabia in Mecca the sand is more than 60 degrees Celsius. It'll burn you back easily. It'll peel off your skin. And then with a, with a stone, so heavy, so large, that needs four men to carry it, was placed on his chest. And then he was whipped, saying, Say that our, our idols are the best. And he would say, Ahadun Ahad, Ahadun Ahad. There's only one God. There's only one God. Suddenly, as he was almost about to kill, kill Bilal radiallahu anhu, a man by the name of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu Habibi Abu Bakr He arrived and he said the messenger has sent me Muhammad sallallahu alayhi I will buy this man off you ya Umayyah How much do you want for him? Name the price And Umayyah said to him He said I'll give him a bit of a high price He said I want 10 golden dinars Everyone laughed around him Suddenly he threw the sack in front of him. Ten golden dinars, ten golden dinars. Umayyah looked up and he said, What a fool you are, you think that you've accomplished something here? I would have asked two dinars for this worthless person, he's worth nothing. You just bought a worthless person for ten dinars. Abu Bakr anhu said, who was being taught by the Messenger Sallam, I would have paid a hundred dinars for him. I would have paid a hundred. And Umayyah was darkened in his face and thought, Damn, I could have made another 90 golden dinars. <laughs> slaves are valuable in Islam. And the first people who followed the Prophet ﷺ were the slaves and servants and the weak. Then the leaders followed, such as Abu Ubaid ibn Jarrah, Umar radiallahu anhu and the rest. The Prophet ﷺ used to promise great rewards in paradise for people who bought slaves and set them free. Or bought women slaves and set them free and then have the choice of marrying them or letting them free. The Prophet ﷺ used to say, Wail, meaning a place in hellfire. Wail to those who harm their servants. Hit them, bash them. And he said, every servant must be fed from the food that you feed your family with. Must be given shelter and comfort. Must be allowed to do these things. So much so that one time Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu. Abu Dhar made a mistake one time. His servant, he had a servant. And he did something wrong. So Abu Dhar slapped him across the face. Suddenly Abu Dhar heard a voice from behind him. A voice saying to him Do you not fear the hellfire because of this weak person in front of you? Abu Dhar looked back wanting to answer back and he found the Prophet ﷺ before him it was the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he said to him Ya Rasulullah he is for free for the sake of Allah I've set him free the Prophet ﷺ said if you did not set him free 
Allah would have punished you in the fire. Subhanallah. Which religion in the world or ideology or, or, or system? I ask you in the name of Allah. Which system in the world has this mercy and its sensitivity to even the slaves like that? Who? Which, which religion? Not one. Islam honored them and lifted them until Bira radiallahu anhu was the caller to the adhan which we call today. But wait a minute, after all this explanation, you still might be thinking slavery, it's still a slave. But you know what? Look at the description and you'll find that the slave in Islam gets more rights and is treated better than the best servant that we have in our contemporary world today. The best servant today. The most expensive and well-paid butler who wears a full suit, yeah? The slave in Islam has better rights than this person. First of all, the slave in Islam sits with you and eats with you. The butler stands while you're eating. But the slave in Islam, he sits with you and he eats with you. He eats the same quality food. You have to do that. He has to sit with you at the same time and eat. He also has to dress from the same quality clothing that you wear. If you wear you know, expensive clothing, your slave has to wear the same kind of clothing. And because of brevity of time, we're not going to go into the many, many explanations and descriptions and stories where the slave would be sometimes dressed better than the master in Islam. Likewise, you're not allowed to hit them. If you hit them, you, you, the price for hitting them is you have to set them free. If you hit a slave, you have to set them free. That's the expiation for that. You're also not allowed to overburden them with work. And that's why, like Salman al-Farisi, he was the governor of a city. They walk in and he's doing some strenuous work. They said, why don't you let the slave boy do it? He said, because uh, we sent him on one task and we don't want to overburden him with another task. You, don't, you can't give him two jobs at the same time. So they eat with you. They dress like you. They eat the same food that you eat. And they wear from the same quality clothing that you wear. You're not allowed to overburden them. In the end, what happens? In the end, you're left with this notion that this is a brother of mine who's just in the home. He's like a family member in the house who helps around. And that's why one of the early Muslims, his name was Sa'ad ibn Hashim al-Khalidi. He said, he's talking about a slave of his, he said, this is not, he's not my, my slave. He is my son whom Allah has put under my care. You see the wordings, very sweet. He is my son that Allah has put under my care. So we see the slave in Islam is treated better than the best butler we have in our contemporary world today. And they're given so many rights and you're not allowed to beat them or abuse them. So the concept of a slave in Islam is very, very different than the concept of a slave in the West. So the next time someone says Islam allows slavery, tell them, do you know what this definition of slavery is? It's the same word that we have in English, but it's a very, very different concept. Make sure you give them that explanation. Sallallahu mubarak ala Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Wassalamu alaykum. ورحمة الله وبركاته Gustave Le Bon, a famous non-Muslim social psychologist, says in his book called Arab Civilization, what I sincerely believe is that slavery among the Muslims is better than slavery among any other people, and that the situation of slaves in the East is better than that of servants in Europe and that slaves in the East are part of the family. Slaves who wanted to be free could attain freedom by expressing this wish, but despite that, they did not resort to exercising this right.